So I, I think seeing all these, this is the last talk of the day, so I'll, I'll make it light for you today, I think. Um, but, you know, seeing all these talks is really what brought me here, I think, and the reason why I'm here. So I'm going to talk to you about, you know, when the heliosphere meets the galaxy. But, but first, as any, all the previous speakers, thank you for the invitation. And uh, unbeknownst to the Academy and to Jan Eric, uh, my path started across the street. So this is very special to me. Um, and then, of course, now today, I, I went, then I went up to the Swedish Institute of Space Physics in Kiruna, and then I emigrated to, to the States. And uh, so now I've been through uh, on the, the JUICE mission, and also working on the New Horizons mission. And so I, I come from the, from the terrestrial media, where you can say, working myself outwards to, towards the, uh, the outer planets, magnetospheres. And now I find myself in the outer heliosphere bordering the galaxy. So, but, you know, it's, I'm not here to talk about my <laughs> journey. <laughs> We're going to talk to you about a, a, a different journey. Uh, and that's, that's the journey of, of the heliosphere through, through, the galact through the interstellar medium. So, so, so here we are, uh, right here in this little corner of the uh, Orion Spur. And uh, so during its evolution, the, the Sun and the, the heliosphere, of course, have completed now nearly 20 revolutions around the galactic core. And, and during this sort of journey through the galaxy, as we like to call it, it's plowed through these widely different uh, environments of interstellar gas and dust and, and, and so on. And also witness all these supernovas going off along the path, kind of like landmines. Uh, blowing at the heliosphere. Uh, and this has, you know, it's all shaped the system that we live in today. Um, and so for a plasma physicist and, and all the scientists here in the, here in the room, uh, we've, we've gone through these vast differences of, of, of densities, speeds, charge fractions, and, and these have all have a dramatic consequences uh, on, on, on the penetration of this interstellar matter through into the heliosphere that, by the way, that have made all of us this interstellar ma matter. And, and also, it's sort of coming to daylight now that it probably has affected several crucial aspects of, of not only the elemental and isotopic abundances in the solar system, but, but also perhaps affected uh, the chemical evolution of atmospheres and who knows, even conditions for habitability. Um, so, as far as we know, uh, only some uh, 60,000 years ago, uh, the sun entered uh, what we call uh, the local... I'm pressing the wrong button here, there we go. Uh, th the sun entered the, the, the local interstellar cloud, as I depict here on, on the picture. And we think that we're, we're now at that very edge of that local cloud up there. And if we zoom in, um, we also know if we look in that direction, it looks like in a, just in a mere thousand years, we'll be going into a void. We might be already in that transition region and entering a completely different uh, interstellar environment. So, so on cosmological timescales, that, that's happening you know, right now. It's like a galactic event of sorts. So, so yet again, I mean, the, the sun and the heliosphere on his journey through through the galaxy is about to undergo uh, yet another transition, um, which then brings me to uh, my title uh, and also the reason why at least I like to explore the heliospheric interaction with the interstellar medium. Um, so only three operating spacecraft, they're currently on an escape trajectory from the heliosphere today. It's Voyager 1, Voyager 2, and New Horizons. Uh, there are two other ones, but they're dead uh, since, since long. And uh, I'll go into to more detail later, but uh, they've uncovered then a range of, of different mysteries and a new, new regime of space physics. Um, and of course, there's a, a fourth possible uh, dedicated interstellar probe mission um, that is also under discussion and under study. And if selected, it would go out there far beyond where Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 will ever reach, uh, more than twice the distance, to, to answer all the outstanding questions and get that connection with the galaxy and really represent the first step into the galaxy for humankind, if you will. All right, but before I launch in, I, I like to take it to, to the basic. I like to come back to the water 
faucet analogy. Um, this is an ordinary faucet running down in a sink uh, with some external flow outside of it. So if we pretend that uh, the faucet itself is, is the solar wind emanating, of course, it, it, it's not in a spiral fashion, but it will do for this. Uh, you reach a point at which um, that, um, that flow speed terminates. Uh, and we see that in the heliosphere as well. Uh, and we call that the, the termination shock. Uh, then you go through a, a sort of a uh, transition region where, where the flow of the solar wind bends back and flows around the, the, the heliosphere and, 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 of course, here the water analogy. And then later on you get to another transition region where basically, at least in theory, the, the influence of this water stops. And that's, that's your heliopause. And, of course, this is all fine and dandy, but in the end, uh, this is hydrodynamic, it's just a sink, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it's complicated because we have all sorts of, uh, it not only is it magnetic, but we have also, very importantly, uh, neutral interactions. Neutrals that penetrate into the heliosphere, charge exchange that are then being brought out uh, as pickup ions that modify this boundary. And uh, also today, we, we, we know, uh, of course, that there are a vast range of, of different other astrospheres around that other stars out there. But the, the, the big point here that none of those that we've observed globally uh, look like our own. And it's a simple reason for that, because the, the, uh, the, the UV intensities or the IR intensities that we would see from those distance uh, G-type st stars are simply too weak. So uh, by going through the heliospheric boundary, not only would you, you know, um, learn about uh, the interaction of our own heliosphere, but it's the only way to, to get the connection and insight into the astrospheric interactions as well, and, and also around G-type stars as our own. Okay. Um, So, like previous speakers, uh, l let's go into why, why Parker made a big foundation here. Um, already in 61, he derived the, the, the two extreme cases for this interaction between a magnetized star, a stellar wind, and, and its surrounding interstellar medium. Um, and what is, what is sort of unique here is that th these two cases, they remain central to the debate. All even today, um, in the discussions, they keep coming up, these two comet-like and bubble-like interactions. So uh, just quickly, on, on your left here, and oh, by the way, I in his paper, of course, after, I think, eight pages of, of complex formulas and equations, he says, this is only my rough calculation. That's why I love it uh, about this. Um, anyway, so if you have a weak uh, external interstellar magnetic field in relation to the uh, in interstellar magnetic field in relation to the solar magnetic field, um, uh, you can derive that you get this sort of comet-shaped interaction um, uh, leading to a comet-shaped heliosphere. Uh, and vice versa, if the external field is very strong, you, you can find it. So, so think about a... a, a a sock, and you put a tennis ball in that sock, and you stretch it out. So the bubble down there, that's your heliosphere, and then you have these two channels coming up, which is the magnetic field. That's the other extreme case uh, that you have as well. Um, for a very long time, decades and decades, we, we clung to this picture, simply because it looks like the magnetosphere. We, we think it's right. I mean, there are other reasons for it, but that's a big part of it as well. Um, okay. Um, so here's just a very brief summary of the very little we know uh, about the heliosphere and its interaction today. I mean, this is extremely simplified, but I like this because it brings everything to bear in this one. Um, not to go into too much detail here, but um, you have, of course, your emanating solar wind uh, that meets the interstellar plasma flow that then uh, deviates uh, and is deflected around the heliosphere. Uh, what is unique is, of course, interstellar neutrals. They do penetrate. Uh, when they get near the sun, they mostly get pho photoionized. They get picked up by the solar wind. And then those same ionized neutrals are being brought out into the boundary. And it turns out that those pickup ions, as we call them, are crucial to how the boundary is formed. 
So in, in some sense, um, it is the interstellar neutrals that already out there form the boundary. Or in other words, the boundary starts being formed already very close to the sun. Um, and as I said, um, there are three spacecrafts out there. Uh, Voyager 1 and 2, they, they remain the sort of interstellar explorers by accident, because if you remember, they were from the beginning planetary missions, uh, and it was a little bit by accident that they, they're then on a uh, escape trajectory, meaning also that they have uh, a payload that is equipped mainly for, for planetary measurements on those scales, not all of it, but... Um, they will continue out to about uh, 2030, which uh, equates for Voyager 1 to about 180 uh, astronomical units, and, and that's when the power, uh, the power generators, the RTGs, will fall below the critical levels. Uh, New Horizons is sitting in here, now about closer to 52 AU, actually, um, and has uh, also two particle instruments, no magnetometer, and uh, when, they ra when we run out of uh, power, we will sit somewhere in the Helios sheath. Um, we will definitely, I think, cross the termination shock, but after that, mm, it's uncertain. But we're, we're, we're doing our best. Okay, so as I said, uh, Voyager 1 and 2, they've, they've left behind a, a range of, of different mysteries. Um, and really what I think is clear, um, and I hope to show you, and I only have a few slides of these mysteries, um, it's really a new regime of space physics that we think we're dealing with. Um, so I like to call these uh, enigmas, basically. Uh, l let, me, let me start with the first one, and, and that's the termination shock. So when, when Voyager 1, uh, when Voy well, both of them, when they crossed the termination shock into that boundary between the termination shock and the heliopause that we call the heliosheath, it, it was a, a completely unexpected shock. We expected that the supersonic solar wind would go through the termination shock and become subsonic and obey the physics uh, that we believe in. But uh, oh no, it, it stays supersonic. And it, it, it turns out that we expected that the plasma would heat in an associated way, but it, but it didn't. It was very, very different. Instead, it seemed like, it appeared like the, uh, the energy of the solar wind was transferred into the more energetic particles that we call the pickup ions. And those are the neutrals that came in from interstellar space, got ionized and came back out. Coincidence? Um, unfortunately, Voyager 1 did not have a pickup ion <laughs> measurement. So there's a big gap, and it turns out that these pickup ions, once they get into the, uh, and accelerate into the helio sheet, they are a part of dominating, they're the dominating part of dominating their pressure in the helio sheath. So, so they're very, very important for this little shell uh, out there. Um, and once Voyager then crossed the heliopause, we got two measurements of the helio sheath thickness, the boundary thickness, and, and modelers uh, before them and even now um, predicted helio sheath thicknesses that, that were more than twice. So Voyager has, has, has really discovered really, really thin helio sheath that we, we can't really reproduce it in models today. So there's physics missing. And then once um, Voyager 1 and 2 passed the heliopause, uh, of course, we, we, we know from... Um, We know from um, other measurements, uh, both from IBEX and also from polarization measurements, that th there ought to be an interstellar magnetic field direction once we're far away enough from, from the heliosphere. Um, we crossed the heliopause and we were waiting for that direction to hit us. But the surprising thing that you'll see, hardly see here, but uh, it's basically this line here. Sure, the magnitude up here, uh, there's a little jump to it, but the direction hardly changed. It was the same solar-like shape uh, and topology uh, of, of that field. And that came, came as a quite a complete uh, surprise. And it just tells you how, how complex that entire topology is. Um, so I like to call this the, uh, the, the magnetic shield. Um, so th this complex topology and the solar magnetic field acts as a shield for th these galactic cosmic rays that the previous speaker was talking about. 
Um, and, and these cosmic rays are, of course, the, these giga electron up to several uh, hundreds and thousands of giga electron volts. They're creating the supernova remnants and, and whatnot, and just permeate, permeates the entire galaxy. Cosmic rays are important because we believe they, uh, they impact uh, atmospheric evolution and, uh, and, uh, and also perhaps even evolution during, uh, through increased rates of mutations and things like this, completely open field. So what we're showing here is, is, is the, uh, the radial snapshot of, of Voyager 1 uh, going out uh, through the heliosphere. So from inside here out to the heliopause. And if you look closely here, this is, a, this is about an order of magnitude increase in, in galactic cosmic rays. And if you pay close attention as well, something very funny happened uh, very close to the heliopause. There was a big sharp jump up to the, uh, the external galactic cosmic ray rate, so, meaning that that very last part of the boundary was very effective in, in shielding out the galactic cosmic rays. What is funny here, or interesting is that uh, that boundary is, is, is actually less than the gyro radius of the galactic cosmic rays. And yet they're affecting them pretty effectively and we don't quite understand why. And that's another part of the mystery. So all in all, this is extremely important to understand not only how the, this boundary out here shields the, the particles, but also on the way out, how does that current sheet in the solar current sheet, how does that affect the, the penetration of cosmic radiance and, and how is that modulated? <coughs> uh, several missions have collected, of course, remote information from inside the heliosphere. The, there are two uh, big missions. There is the NASA IBEX mission and there's the NASA Cassini mission. Uh, sitting at, uh, IBEX is sitting at one AU, looking out and, and uh, detecting from all directions, the energetic neutral atoms being created in the helio sheath and beyond. Um, and the same with Cassini, but sitting then, of course, at, uh, in cruise phase to, to Saturn, you could collect the data there and, and the images. Um, slightly different energy ranges uh, when they looked at the, the patterns in the sky, but the patterns in the sky they, they detected were, of course, completely um, unexplained. I, mean, I think there were 30, 34 models trying to predict what we would see, but none of them even came close. Of course, after we got the data, uh, models started to converge. Uh, there are several theories on how these patterns are, are made. However, uh, the big takeaway here is that th these two measurements still deviate, although they are based on the same principle. Um, uh, on the IBEX side, uh, they see and, and predict, a, they derive a, a slightly tail-like comet-like structure of the heliosphere, while on the Cassini side, it's a bubble-like. Uh, and these are from the same measurement techniques and same analysis technique, and yet they go apart. And hence, it's still central to debate. But it's intuitive to see. I mean, we're sitting inside a heliosphere. We're trying to look out and do sounding techniques of a three-dimensional structure. That is the biggest structure that we've done from, uh, from inside the heliosphere yet, uh, in terms of heliophysics. So it's, it's very hard. <coughs> okay. Um, now even beyond uh, Voyager. Um, so it turns out, so here's a map of, of the, interst the local interstellar medium as I showed in the beginning. And it turns out that, that the sun here is in contact with uh, right now probably four, four different clouds in a complex pattern. Um, and what the animation shows here, the black dot, that's your sun. This is the timer. This is the clock. We're entering the uh, lick, the local interstellar cloud, about 60,000 years ago. And right now at zero, we're at the edge of it. What is not shown is the next cloud over here, and that's the G cloud also approaching uh, through the relative motions. Um, so I in a sense, this is a... It's, a, it's serendipitous because it's happening right now. It's been happening for the last thousands of years, but that's now. <laughs> and uh, and what, is, what, what is most intriguing, I think, I, I talked to uh, Jeff Linsky and, and Seth Redfield, who was part of putting together this animation, and I asked them, well, what is the, what's the prediction of the G cloud? I mean, how, how will it affect the, the heliosphere? What are the densities? What are the charge fractions? And, and the basic answer is, uh, well, I mean, we, we don't know. 
I mean, they, they sketch out these, these sizes, but remember all this information, that's 75 stars absorption spectra to the nearest 75 stars in the sky. And then you derive a three-dimensional structure. And, and everybody knows it's, it's, it's a little bit of a guesswork. And it's even worse because when, when you look at the properties of the G cloud, the uncertainties are very large. So the, the basic answer is that, well, the, the heliosphere could become, the heliopause could go out to s some 300 AU, say three times the size today, or it could compress down to, who knows, the, the, the orbit of Saturn or, or something like that, just because we don't know the environment of the G cloud. Okay, um, so, so, th so that, that's very important to understand how, how the heliosphere uh, reacts to these upstream conditions and also understand our place within in the interstellar cloud, and that's completely unknown. Um, so two things here, uh, also outside, um, Voyager is outside the, the heliopause. We, we do have uh, galactic cosmic, unshielded galactic cosmic ray spectra. Uh, and it turns out that the galactic cosmic rays below two, gig, two giga electron volts, they never make it in because they, they, they're deflected uh, at the boundary. So coming out there and, and measuring, especially the low energies below uh, a couple of uh, GeV, is terribly important. And I think the previous speaker mentioned the, the lithium beryllium boron star story, uh, because it, it tells you the shape of the spectrum, tells you the history of how they were produced. And how they were produced was from spallation uh, through the interstellar medium. So it gives you that insight of the story of the interstellar medium they travel through. Uh, and yet from Voyager, I think we have just a couple of data points on, the, on that spectrum up there. Uh, so it's still a very open question. Interstellar dust, uh, I know John Eric is going to smile now, but um, in my mind, they, they are like the galactic messengers. Um, uh, below, uh, below, say, 0.3, below 0.3 micron, they start, since they're negatively charged, they start behaving very, very chaotically uh, when it comes to the interaction with the heliosphere. And, and even below that, they get completely shielded out. Um, so if you look at the prediction models and what we measure inside the heliosphere of, inter interstellar, of interstellar dust grains and the mass distribution, it, it, they go wildly apart. I mean, they don't even lean in the same direction. Um, so, so it's very clear. Uh, and unfortunately, of course, Voyager doesn't have an, an interstellar dust uh, detector. It does have the plasma wave antennas that measures total dust, but you, you can't really get your, your mass distribution from that. Um, so mass di distribution in all honor, uh, but there is also key information inside the interstellar dust grains because they are they're, they're created from, from stellar blow-off and are, are thus you know, linked to, to stellar formation. And it's believed that all the heavy ions in the stellar formation process are locked up inside of those dust grains. So we got to get inside of them. If we get inside of them, we'll start unlocking the secrets of the also stellar formation. Okay. Um, I'm going to take one step back and have one slide on, on this larger journey. Uh, every galactic year is between, I think, 230 and 250 million years or something like that. Uh, as I said, the sun has now completed 20 revolutions, if you do the math correctly, um, which means that dinosaurs, they, they took off here. If, in, if this is one galactic year, this is where the dinosaurs uh, were born or created. And the, the big dinosaur extinction is somewhere around here. What was that, 65 million years ago or so? Um, and then uh, I, I've exaggerated here just to, to you, you can see a separation at all. But human race is, is right here. We're just a sliver of that little galactic year. So you can ask yourself where we are today. Um, uh, here, here's a rendering of, of, a, of a model prediction of what the heliosphere looks like today. Um, uh, and your solar system is, of course, completely encased uh, down here. And the scales, um, your heliopause is sitting at 120 AU. Uh, and that's what we have today. 
Then you look at um, iron 60 deposit uh, in the ocean sediments. Um, and it's very clear that three million years ago, there was a supernova that, that took off. And you can look at several different evidence and, and you can make that case. So what was quickly done after that discovery was, you know, on our side, we asked ourselves, well, what happened to the heliosphere? I mean, there's a range of assumptions that you got to make because it's very, very complicated. But if you make uh, assumptions of where you are in relation to interstellar clouds, and uh, you take the best fit to the distance of the supernova, which was 50 parsecs, and, and you compute and you run your models, this is what happens. So that's, that's your heliopause. And this is three million years ago. So that means that the entire solar system was completely exposed to the interstellar medium. Uh, and number one that you think about is galactic cosmic rays going up orders of magnitude for God, know, God knows how long, exposing all the inner planets. Um, but the, the, the other unexpected thing here is, depending on which cloud you go through, if you have high dense, a high density cloud, your neutral hydrogen densities go through the roof and may have pretty dramatic consequences even for, for the atmosphere. I, I think the bottom line here is, is not that this is any prediction of any means, it, it's just that it's completely changing the picture from this sort of static interstellar medium out there where the heliosphere has bobbed around for, for eons. It hasn't. It's this sort of landmine mentality. And it's been sort of, um, it's so linked to that entire 4.6 billion year evolution of the sun and the entire family of the solar system that we got to take it into account. Anyway, so I, I, I recommend you go and, go and look, uh, look up Ofer's and, and Loeb's paper in 2022. It's, it's very thrilling reading. It's out on Archive X now, I think. Okay. Um, so what, what does the, the future uh, look like? Uh, so uh, to, to that end, uh, to answer this question, NASA directed uh, a four-year mission concept study. Thank you, NASA. Um, that has now been completed. Uh, I believe um, it is the, uh, the most detailed engineering and science study be behind a mission that has, has been done for this type of, of mission. Um, and of course, what I'm talking about is, is, is this guy out here, this interstellar probe. And the way we would like to think about this is that this is a pragmatic mission concept. Um, and it targets um, about 400 AU in the nominal mission. That's a 50-year nominal design lifetime because in NASA, we like to have uh, design lifetimes to which we actually design the spacecraft that will survive. Um, but looking back at Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, uh, they outlived their design lifetimes by about a factor of 10. They were designed for 4.5 years. It's now, I think, 44 years. If I do the, the math correctly. So all in all, um, uh, that may uh, very well live on uh, in an extended mission, at least out to maybe five, six, uh, or even more AU. Uh, so this is much more than twice than, than Voyager 1. Um, it's not a new idea. Um, we got to remember that. Um, uh, Nikki mentioned uh, 1958 for, for Parker Solar Probe, uh, a probe towards the sun. Then later in 1960, there was a, a committee report coming out to the Space Science Board under the National Academies uh, uh, with, uh, with the proposition of, of three probes. Uh, the first one was, again, a, a probe towards the sun. Uh, the second one was a probe perpendicular to the ecliptic. And the third one was a probe directed away from the sun to go and measure uh, the galactic cosmic rays and, and, and the plasma. So the nature of the science question has really changed over 60 years. It's still out there. It's still, you know, completely unexplored territory. Um, and what we did here was to, um, to rein in the international science community. We held uh, four, four workshops, many special sessions, wrote a big report, uh, more than 500 pages, you can download it if you want. Um, 
But we sort of honed in, uh, keeping in mind the past studies as well, on, on sort of three pillars and three science questions. Uh, and it's all the science that I've talked about. And, and the first one is, is what are these, these processes um, shaping the heliosphere in sort of a static fa fashion? We, we need, and, and they start from, from the sun, basically from, from launch, going all the way out, making that snapshot to measure uh, all the particle distributions, the neutrals uh, and everything else, um, and through the boundary. And then the second pillar here is, is how, what are those processes in, uh, under a dynamic variation and under a dynamic sun, and also under the influence of a slowly changing interstellar medium. And then, of course, the third pillar is, is what are the properties of, of the unexplored interstellar medium? And, and all of those, they then tie back together, not only to understand um, the current state of the heliosphere today and its interaction, which is, you know, to me, the most outstanding uh, question in space physics, but it also allows us, if we tie these th three together, it allows us to extrapolate not only what happened back then, but also to understand where we're going next. So I, I think that sort of encapsulates really what, what this idea and mission concept is about. Okay, um, a few more slides, and uh, I'll be pr pretty brief, and I'll end with a movie. Um, so you all wonder, what does an interstellar probe look like? It does not look like this, any of these. Uh, we can talk uh, afterwards of why they should not look like this. But it looks like this. Um, it, it's very reminiscent <laughs> of a normal <laughs> spacecraft, lo and behold. Um, and for those of you who have seen Voyager, uh, it kind of looks like Voyager, and that's not by chance, because we need a big antenna. This is a high-gain antenna of uh, about five meters, uh, basically the biggest we one can fit in a fairing. Um, and, um, and then you have uh, a suite of instruments that we put, put on. This is by no means a, a defined payload. That's up to a NASA definitions team to put down. Uh, you can see the usual su suspects. I think we have about 10, ten instruments, including, yes, plasma wire antennas in the baseline mission. Uh, for power, two RTGs, um, and they will then last us through that 50-year nominal lifetime. So we've gone through a, a big trade study of how you provide exactly that power. Uh, trajectory that we'll show you in the movie is, is, this, is this is chemical propulsion. Th these are near-term available launch vehicles. There, there's no antimatter drive. Uh, we go out for a passive Jupiter gra gravity assist. It, it's a direct inject Jupiter. And you come out with for one scenario that we picked as the first scenario uh, of about 7 AU per year, which is twice the, the speed of Voyager 1. Um, design lifetime, as I said, 50 years. Um, and uh, the first launch opportunity that comes up is, is in 2036. Um, and if you deal with Jupiter, uh, the, uh, the, the maxima of the outbound speed, it's a maximum sort of every 13 months. But the whole deal here is that the, the launch window towards the forward hemisphere of the heliosphere, the nose region, it opens up at 2036. And then you can go and pick off your launch opportunities if you don't want to start with that one. Um, here's the stack up. Uh, we have worked with uh, the launch vehicle providers. Uh, we've talked to SpaceX, Blue Origin, but of course also to NASA and the SLS office. And the SLS office was, were the ones that we were open arms uh, really in the beginning and, and uh, gave us a lot of active input. All right, so um, to end this off, here's a... Here's how it might look like um, on, uh, on, uh, on a particular day in, in 2036 and, and a spacecraft mass of 860 kilograms. That, what you see there is, is it is an SLS block too, not because others can't do it, it's simply because these are the guys who worked with us and, and provided the technical data. Um, uh, there might be new data coming soon from other providers which we're waiting for. There you see the booster separating, uh, and uh, that takes us up in, in a low Earth orbit where we have a further separation that will uh, 
reveal the upper exploration stage. And you fire that off to basically uh, uh, kick you off in the lowest point of, of Earth's gravity well. And then later you will also see that separation. Uh, we have a bunch of stages in this rocket. It's beautiful. <laughs> And, and that's your Atlas V Centaur that is kicked off. And then lastly, that's your Star 48 right there. So the idea here is that we, we, we burn everything at Earth. And we did trade this with, well, maybe we could carry the Star 48 to Jupiter and, and blow it off in, 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 in Jupiter gravity. It doesn't give you much. Um, you turn the high, after commissioning, you turn your high gain antenna to Earth. Uh, you, you spin up this in the baseline will be a spinner. And uh, soon you will then uh, release the, the plasma wire booms or antennas that are 50 meter long and uh, flip out the, uh, the, uh, the magnetometer booms and, and continue measurements actually from directly after near Earth commissioning. This shot is a direct inject to Jupiter. Takes you seven months to Jupiter, it takes you six hours to the moon. After this last kick of the uh, passive Jupiter gravity assist, that takes you up to about seven to eight a year per year and reaching the termination shock in a mere 12 years and then the interstellar medium in about 24 years. And there we go to boldly go where no one has gone before. Let's begin. <laughs> 